Tennessee Explorers is made possible in part by a grant from the National Science Foundation. That skull that they're holding is representing a once living person. They can actually tell that person's life story. These different aspects of who we are can manifest themselves through a career in exploration. Having a goal in mind, having exciting things to do, motivated young people. Tennessee's history began with exploration, and that same adventurous spirit lives on today. World-class explorers across our state are doing amazing research in many fields of science, creating new technologies and mentoring those who will follow in their footsteps. During the next half hour, we'll share the journeys of three modern-day Tennessee explorers. I think it's important for people to understand how it is that we bring all of the data together to actually tell a story of people that lived a, a thousand years ago. Tiffany Tung's passion for exploration would lead to a career in anthropology. But as a teenager, that path to success was by no means certain when she dropped out of high school at 16. Much to my parents' chagrin, they were not very pleased with this. But I thought that I wanted to do other things, and so I traveled for a little bit, I worked a little bit, just sort of exploring the wider world. Would Tiffany's interest in the wider world continue to lead her away from education? If so, how would she find a career challenging enough to satisfy her adventurous spirit? The answer lies in her past. I was really fortunate as a kid to have parents who encouraged me to be curious and kind of helped me satisfy my curiosity. Nearby where I grew up, there is a, an area called Peña Adobe. It was an old Native American site in California. And I can remember as a kid going there and, and occasionally we would find these obsidian arrowheads. And when you find something like that as a child, you're kind of curious, where did this come from? And I remember asking my mother about this and she would explain to me that there were these human populations that lived there long before Westerners arrived on the scene. My father immigrated from, from China in the uh, early 1950s. And so growing up as a kid in California, I was very aware of the differences between kind of Chinese customs and American customs. I can remember specifically my dad also telling me stories about uh, being in China and when the Japanese invaded. And I remember my father saying, many Americans have no idea what it's like to be occupied. And you know, to this day, I, I'm still very interested in how different cultural groups might invade or attempt to, to conquer other groups. Nurtured by her parents, Tiffany's inquisitive mind eventually needed more than high school could provide. But her teenage explorations only strengthened her desire to learn, eventually prompting her return to school. After traveling around for a little bit, I realized that, you know, I think I did want to pursue higher education and find a way to study these other cultural groups in, in more detail. And really the only way to do that was by attending college. So then I enrolled at UC Santa Barbara. And it just sort of reminds me that not everybody has to take the exact same pathway to um, pursue higher education and so forth, that you can take time out and meander and explore other things before you really hit upon something that really excites you and interests you. Serendipity played a part. I just happened to have a really great professor who did research in Peru. And then I took an archaeology class and that kind of crystallized um, my interest in Andean archaeology. I'm what's called an anthropological bioarchaeologist. So I study human skeletal remains that we excavate from archaeology sites. I read it as sort of a bony diary, right? It's a way to understand the health status and life experiences of past peoples. And then I use those skeletal data to say something about these human societies, and that's the anthropological side of it. By reading the condition and chemical elements within these bony diaries, Tiffany can determine the person's health, what they ate, where they were from, and to whom they were related. And now a large part of my research is focused on understanding how imperial actions affect the health status of, of ancient populations and how it can change their cultural practices even. You can see the head um, up there to the west and you can see interestingly a piece of copper in the mouth. My interest brought me to 
uh, the Warrior Empire, which is a group that thrived in the Andes about AD 600 to AD 1000. And they were one of the first um, expansive empires in, in South America. So a lot of my research now is focused on understanding that particular group. Through my analysis of these human skeletal remains and these mummies, I've seen a lot of trauma on the bodies, and a lot of this trauma was likely inflicted in warfare. And we know this because of uh, paintings on the ceramics or iconography that shows warriors wearing uh, battle regalia and, and carrying weapons. One thing that we discovered at one of these archaeology sites were these uh, isolated human skulls. And as I conducted the analysis, I realized that these were actually what we call uh, human trophy heads. So these are skulls that have been intentionally decapitated. And then they were transformed in really unique ways. They would uh, drill a hole on the top of the skull and they would put a carrying cord through it. These heads could have been the heads of local ancestors that were being venerated, or they could have been heads of foreign enemies. And that was actually one of my big research questions that I was trying to, to address. Tiffany found her answer by analyzing a specific chemical element in the skulls called strontium, allowing her to determine their origin. These are all the local individuals, mm -hmm. what their strontium isotope values are. Mm -hmm. And then here's the trophy heads. The, these are the moments when I'm alone in my office where I get very excited <laughs> because when the data are mapped out, I can see that I've got really strong evidence that the trophy head individuals are coming from foreign lands. They may just look like bars <laughs> on a graph, but to me, this is, these lines are, you know, people's lives. And this was a teenage girl about 16 to 19 years of age. And she was sacrificed in front of a ritual temple. And then these other individuals were adult males who were sacrificed and decapitated and turned into trophy heads. Archaeology is very exciting. I mean, the, the thought of going out to the field and you're in Peru in the high altitude in the, in the Andes and you're excavating at a site and you're beginning to unearth something that somebody hasn't seen in a thousand years. I mean, that's pretty incredible and it's a real privilege to be able to uncover these items once again and then to tell the story about the people that lived a thousand years ago. I mean, that's one of the highlights of my job, I think. My husband is also an archaeologist. He works in Peru. So we've collaborated together on projects and we're now getting ready to work together on another project. And this means that we're gonna bring our new daughter with us to the field. We're really looking forward to the moment when she can learn how to wield a trowel really well because we ex fully expect to put her in one of those excavation units so she can excavate with us. A lot of my work has also involved outreach. So I've been able to work with students at, for example, Martin Luther King High School here in Nashville. Involving young students in this kind of archeological research is a definite highlight. It stirs a kind of curiosity in them. I like the idea of my work having resonance to students down the road and kind of understanding cultural practices of other groups that lived thousands of years ago. And if I can make that kind of contribution to help us kind of pop open the lid in terms of how other societies once lived, I mean, this is the kind of, of information and understandings that I would like to leave. The work uh, that scientists and other kind of scholars do taps into this kind of fundamental curiosity that I think a lot of people have. And I think if we could help young people and, and other individuals become interested in, in these kinds of questions and help them to look at the wider world around them and think about what is it that they would like to understand a little bit more, I think that would be an important task for us to accomplish. The combination of science and patriotism and the ideal of making a contribution to society and to humanity, those things have all been interwoven in my history from the very beginning. Our next explorer faced the challenge of melding his love of interstellar mysteries with his goal of helping others achieve the American dream. With a first name meaning Saturn, Kayvon Stassen found his path to the stars in the hostile Arizona desert. My mother was and is a very demanding woman. She persevered through some very difficult challenges in her life. She was born in southern Mexico, and as a young girl, dreamed of someday coming to America, of partaking in the American dream. And so as a young woman, pregnant with me, she made the very daring move 
to, uh, to enter the United States, motivated by the idea that her child would be a U.S. citizen, be able to lead the charge in pursuit of the American dream. And what she expected from me was greatness, or maybe more importantly, the aspiration toward greatness, whatever that might be, that I identify my gifts and then pursue them toward the higher goal of service to society and mankind. I learned to fake it when it came to sports, uh, but faking it didn't get me very far for very long. But that's not where my God-given gifts were to be. I liked computers. Part of that was that I liked playing video games. But, you know, just as much as I liked playing the video games, I also liked tinkering on the computer at a more technical level taking the computer apart, figuring out how it worked, uh, writing computer programs to do little things. That was the kind of thing that to me was fun. I consider myself looking back now very fortunate. At a very young age, I was identified by the public elementary school that I was going to as an academically gifted child. And so I was tracked into the science and math magnet school. Kayvon thrived in the new environment and continued to excel through high school. His hard work paid off with a full scholarship to the University of California at Berkeley. But Kayvon was struggling to reconcile his mother's goals for him with his desire to be a scientist. Gibor Basri, Kayvon's astronomy professor and mentor, inadvertently showed the young man his future by allowing him to experience his past. The professor that I was working with at Berkeley took me to the Kitt Peak National Observatory in southern Arizona. And looking out toward the, toward the south from that mountain ridge next to the observatory, I found myself for the first time face to face with the very same expanse of desert that my mother had walked across and that had brought me to that point. It really took hold for me in that instant in a very powerful way. I can pursue my passion to study the stars and use that as a vehicle to enable others coming behind me to pursue their passion. I realized this is my calling and that call has been there since I was a child and I've been hearing it in the stories of my mother from the very beginning. With a new sense of purpose, Kayvon graduated from Berkeley in 1994 and began working on his doctorate at the University of Wisconsin. While there, Kayvon, true to his mother's teaching, began the first of several outreach programs for minority children. In 2003, he accepted a position at Vanderbilt University. His continued dedication to sharing the American dream led to the creation of a new bridge program between Vanderbilt and Fisk universities. The program guides minority students through undergraduate studies to PhDs in science and engineering. My own research centers around the question of how do stars like our sun and solar systems come to be? Several years ago, my research team and I were scouring through a large pile of data and we were looking for the possibility of finding a stillborn star. In other words, a star that was in the process of being born but didn't quite make it. It didn't have enough material in order to eventually light up as a full-fledged star. This is what we call a brown dwarf. And we had this signal in our data, but it was very peculiar. The nature of the data that we had made it pretty clear that the objects that were orbiting and periodically blocking one another were not stars. While working at Kitt Peak National Observatory, Kayvon took measurements of the amount of light coming from an object that he suspected to be a newborn star. The amount of light changed in a repeating way indicating that there were actually two stars orbiting around one another that occasionally blocked each other's light. But to make the brightness measurements from his different observations match up, Kayvon needed to figure out just how often the stars orbited one another. He calculated their orbits, assuming that they weighed what ordinary stars weigh. But the data from the different observations just wouldn't match up. 
I was able to finally get the data to match together in just the right way so that I could finally see, <gasps> here's what's happening. The reason the system looks so strange is because these are not two stars at all. They are both brown dwarfs. We had two stillborn stars orbiting one another, and nobody had ever seen anything like this. We were seeing something for the very first time, and it was a discovery that had come together through years of teamwork from my entire research team working together, but I also got to experience just that, that thrill of discovery, that aha moment. The aha moments are exciting, but as Kayvon can tell you, they're also rare. You have to be the kind of person who can say, I'm probably not gonna make a great discovery this day, but that's okay. And to be able to do that day after day after day, and sometimes, frankly, it's discouraging. And to be able to then step back and say, I gotta keep at this, and we're gonna make some headway eventually. And eventually you do, and, that, and that's really rewarding. But you've gotta be able to stick to it. Kayvon can trace his determination and never say die attitude to that heroic journey through the Altar Valley many years ago. Too often we cheapen what heroism means because we equate it with fame and glory. The people you admire are those who did things that were hard because they were important. And so for me, my heroes are are those people in my life who, who did the hard but necessary things because they were important. Um, and that's what I try to stay true to. With my boys, uh, I feel particularly compelled for them to know the stories that I know that have been so important in my life. And they will learn what it means to be an American and how, what, what an exceptional and special thing that is and what kind of responsibility comes with that privilege. What a fascinating thing to be in the first group of women to come into the astronaut program. How do women's bodies differ from men's when you put them in this strange environment? How are women going to be able to fit into this program that's been all men up to this point? Our next explorer would answer those questions during her years as a NASA astronaut. If anyone has ever been at the right place at the right time with the right stuff, it's Ray Seddon, Tennessee's First Lady of Space. I've met a number of the women who put themselves through the same physical exams as the original Mercury astronauts did. They passed the physical exams, but NASA said you just don't have the credentials that we're requiring. And those women, had they been born 20 years later, would have been astronauts, some of them. But they were just too early. I was just at the right place at the right time. I grew up in Murfreesboro, which was a very small town then, and envisioned living the kind of life that my mother led, marrying, having children, and having family. Sputnik, I think, began my thought processes about perhaps being able to do something else. Then there were plans to, to send people into space. And I think that caught my imagination and certainly the imagination of my generation. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. There was a national imperative. It really was the beginning of the space race. People were told that we, we need to improve our science education and our engineering, and, and so I think we were all caught up in that. My first science project, we had to do a poster of some sort at the end of seventh grade, and there was a Life magazine article that had come out about what might happen to humans in weightlessness. Dire predictions, G-forces on launch, a lot of things that, that I thought were just kind of fascinating. 
So I was getting into some fairly advanced thinking even in grammar school and then got even more interested with high school biology and I think my focus became life sciences at that point in time. I had kind of a dual life back then. I had lots of fun being a cheerleader and hanging out with all of my friends, but um, I had another group of intellectual friends. It was a lot of fun to have both worlds. Most of my friends took biology, chemistry, and physics, but most of them weren't particularly interested in it. I was so interested in it that it really didn't matter what other people thought of it. Ray's independence and self-confidence would serve her well as she ventured cross-country and across cultures to college in California during the turbulent 60s. I think Berkeley showed me that the world was a lot different from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. People thought in different ways. You had to defend your own beliefs. It, it was that depth of thinking um, that I think was something that, that I carried away with me, not only for the sciences, but also for life in general. At Berkeley, I was beginning to see the women's movement, and we were beginning to see a, more of a demand for uh, women uh, in all fields. That's when I began to think that perhaps they would have scientists or physicians in space someday. I thought there might be a chance for someone with my scientific interests sometime in the future. With her thoughts still on the stars, but her feet firmly planted in reality, Ray's love of science led her to a medical degree from the University of Tennessee in 1973, one of only six women in a class of 100. I thought my, my future was going to be in the medical field, so I pursued the things that I was interested in, but I knew that NASA was probably not gonna look for pediatricians to fly in space, and so I did some moonlighting in emergency rooms. I thought it was one of the things that NASA might require. So I tried to, once again, have the two parts of my life to be able to blend and to be able to do both things, just in case the opportunity would be there later on. And it didn't take long for opportunity to knock. A fellow neurosurgery resident told me that NASA was going to be selecting a new astronaut class and they were opening the, the applications for women. There are certain things in one's life where you think, you know, I was just at the right place at the right time. I definitely was, um, but I think part of it is taking advantage of the opportunities that come along at the time that you're, you're ready to pursue something. Ray jumped at the chance to fulfill her childhood dream and became one of NASA's first female astronauts. But this was no fairy tale ending. Ray and her female colleagues had many obstacles to overcome, including gender stereotypes and a male-dominated profession. When we got to NASA, we felt like, at least outwardly, uh, we seemed to be well accepted. It was only later on that I read or heard that there was, there was considerable grumbling. Some of the men in the astronaut program didn't feel that, that women should be allowed in. But I think when the men saw that we were willing to face the challenges, it sort of became a non-issue. There were a lot of things that we discovered about the human body on my second flight because it was the first time a mission had been dedicated to life sciences. So we did experiments on many different body systems so that that could all be integrated. So we were able to put the pieces and parts together and say, oh, this is how this system interacts with that system. And we were able for the first time to get good information on women to be able to compare. We did find out that, that women react the same way as men. Uh, there's basically no difference, a little bit of difference in handling of calcium, and we know that women's hormones affect bones, but there was nothing show-stopping about what happened to the women. We were also able to learn what systems adapt to a weightless environment, and reach a new space normal, as we say, and which systems continue to uh, perhaps deteriorate and may be a problem for long-term space travel. As always, Ray confronted and overcame all roadblocks on her way to outer space, even finding love along the way. But her marriage to fellow astronaut Robert Hoot Gibson presented another challenge that neither Ray nor NASA had ever faced before. I was the first astronaut that got pregnant as an astronaut. My husband and I went and, and told the, 
my boss said that I was pregnant and I wanted to continue with my work, it was almost as though they hadn't thought about that. There were certain restrictions placed on me, but I think because I continued to work uh, through my pregnancy and they saw that that was doable, I could continue, and I did. My kids lived in a community where a lot of the people were astronauts. It was just part of their life. They didn't uh, realize that we did something really different. They did notice that when people said, what do your mom and dad do if they said they're astronauts, people tended not to believe them. Watching her children grow is just one of many fond memories Ray has of her time as a shuttle astronaut. But those memories are also tinged with tragedy, a terrible loss that for a time turned her dream of exploration into a nightmare. Probably the only time that I considered leaving was after the Challenger accident because the reality of, of what could happen was there. And to see what happened to the families of the Challenger astronauts. But I was already assigned to the, the science mission that I had always wanted to fly since I had gotten to NASA. And I just had to come to grips with the fact that it, there was risk involved. And maybe some people only want to make one flight to say they did it, but there are others of us that, that feel like uh, we really want to make the contribution, whatever contribution we can, and that we're willing to take the risk for that. In spite of the risks, Ray Seddon contributed greatly to the shuttle program, spending more than 700 hours in orbit as a mission specialist and payload commander. She realized the dreams of a small town Tennessee girl using her lifelong love of science to prepare future explorers for the final frontier. What I wanted to do when I got to NASA was answer those questions that, that interested me in seventh grade uh, and explore and be a part of the studies um, that answered those questions. And that's the kind of exploration that I wanted to do and was fortunate enough uh, on all three of my missions to do some of those studies. And once you've flown in space, you know, you've, you're a real astronaut. That was something that no one could ever take away from me. It's kind of like that MD degree, once you get it, you've got it. And it was um, so unusual, especially for women, to have that opportunity that, yeah, we had to pinch ourselves and we weren't quite sure that we had really done it. Today, Ray continues to use what she learned in space to help improve medical care here on Earth. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, keep exploring. I believe that there are kids listening to this right now who feel this is why you were put on this Earth. It was to be an explorer, to make great discoveries, to be a team player in one of the most noble pursuits that human beings have ever pursued. And if we can just help them from being too distracted from it, uh, they will be great. I'm very optimistic about that. Tennessee Explorers was made possible in part by a grant from the National Science Foundation.